By far my favourite disciple is Judas Iscariot. He being dead for 2,000 years still speaks and he speaks volumes. He's a signpost of where not to go and the sternest of warnings of what not to do. Judas has taught me of the self-deceptive nature of hypocrisy, of the subtlety of greed, that the love of money really is the root of all evil. He showed me that it's not enough to believe in Jesus, that it's not even enough to follow him. Judas traveled with Jesus for three exciting years. He was there when Lazarus was raised from the dead, but that was not enough to convert him. Neither did seeing Jesus calm the storm, feed 5,000 miraculously, multiplying fish and bread, or seeing him walk on water, heal the sick or give sight to the blind. With all that he saw and did, Judas didn't see Jesus of Nazareth as having much worth at all. He is worth about 30 pieces of silver. It was because of his love of money that he committed one of the most heinous acts in human history. Even 2,000 years later, his name is synonymous with the stink of a skunk. How many people do you know that have called their son Judas? In fact, for the last 100 years, the most popular first name in America is James. It ranks number one on the popularity list. Judas is ranked down at 25,549. So what was his big problem? His problem was that he didn't fear God. And he who doesn't fear God will lie to you, he will steal from you, will blaspheme the name of the God who gave him life, and beware, he who has no fear of God may even kill you if he thinks he can get away with it. In the United States, more than seven people die a violent death every hour. Judas thought that he would get away with his murderous betrayal. What he actually did was put a noose around his own neck. Let me share something very personal with you. When I was 16 years old, six years before my conversion, I tasted of the fear of the Lord. I was in the back of a dance hall in long grass in the dark with a pretty young lady. As we lay in the grass, my intentions weren't honorable. But she said something to me that put the fear of God in me. She turned to me and just said, you know what? God is watching us. It was like a bucket of ice water falling down from the heavens, I said, well, let's just go back inside. The fear of God, even as a non-Christian, stopped me from making a terrible mistake, getting a young, innocent girl pregnant, bringing shame to her family, maybe causing her to have an abortion. So how do we obtain the fear of the Lord? Is it holding God in awe as we would a sunrise or a sunset? I think it's much more. The psalmist says, my soul trembles for fear of you. The Apostle Paul said, Wherefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Israel, when God gave his commandments, cried out, Don't let him speak anymore, lest we die. They were terrified. Even Moses said, I'm exceedingly fearful and quake. That was when God came with a smile on his face to give his law. How much more fearful will it be when he comes in wrath? I've been stopped from open air preaching by the police probably about a dozen or so times. And I always do what they tell me, and there's a reason for that. When I was in New Zealand many years ago, the police didn't have guns. They had sticks. If someone was naughty, that hit them with a stick. So when a police officer in the United States approaches me, the first thing I see is a gun. I say to myself, he's got a gun. If I move quickly, put my hand in my pocket, whatever, he could kill me. He wants to get home to see his family tonight. So I have more than an awe or a reverence for the police. I'm terrified they'll shoot me. And that causes me to do what they say. I don't argue about First Amendment rights. If he says to move, I move. Why? Because I love my life. Now listen to what Jesus said about the fear of the Lord. He said, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him, that's God, who was able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's more than a reverence, that's fearing what God can do to you in hell. Do you remember what happened when Jesus spoke of eating his flesh and drinking his blood? How many of the professed disciples were offended and they left? That was understandable if he was speaking literally. But clearly he wasn't talking about cannibalism. When he was with his disciples and he took bread and he said, this is my body which is broken for you, he wasn't saying the bread was his body, it was symbolic. And the reason we know that is because his body was still there holding the bread. Do you remember what he said after those many disciples turned back from following him? Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. 
To whom can we go when we don't understand the hard things of Scripture, or when we go through fiery trials? There is no one but Jesus who can take us through this life into the next. In Him alone, we have forgiveness of sins and the hope of immortality. This isn't the weak hope of which the world speaks. The Bible speaks of having a living hope in our death, one that's based on the immutable promises of Almighty God. Now watch this. Who was Judas? Judas. Judas, Judas. I know who Mary is. I do not know who Judas is. So is that what Mormonism has taught you? Yes, sir. Tell me your thoughts on the afterlife. You can either grow up in heaven or hell, depending on which, whatever you believe in. We're talking about life before we were born, is that what you're saying? Life before we were born, Craig. So this is a Mormon doctrine? Yeah. So. Have you been born again? Um, honestly, I don't know. I think so, because I just, I think so. You're not sure? I'm not sure. You know, in John chapter 3, Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So it's essential you're born again. He said, marvel not that I say to you, you must be born again. Got a question for you. Who was Judas? Judas. Who is Judas? I know who Mary is. I do not know who Judas is. He was the one that betrayed Jesus. The one that betrayed the fallen angel? Or the no, one? that was Lucifer. Lucifer, okay. Yeah. When did you last read your Bible? It's been a good minute, a good few months, probably back in June, July. Yeah, Judas was the one that betrayed Jesus. He was one of the disciples. The Bible says he was stealing money. He was the treasurer, but he was stealing money from the bag, and he was a hypocrite. Are you going to make it to heaven? I believe I will. Why? By doing the right thing and staying away from all the negative things being around you. Staying positive with a good, great mind and always talking to God is always the way to do it and always the way to go. It'll keep your mind clear and your mind on the right path to success. So is that what Mormonism has taught you? Yes, sir. Okay. Are you a good person? Yeah, I'm a good person. I'm nice. I, I share. I give to the poor, you know. Are you morally good? Yeah, I say that. Okay. I'm going to give you a standard to judge yourself. Okay. And then you make a judgment after we've looked at the standard. The standard is the Ten Commandments. Are you familiar with them? Yeah. So let's go to the ninth, you shall not be a false witness. How many lies have you told in your life? I told a few. A few ever lies. stolen something? No, sir. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yes, sir. Okay, now would you use your mother's name as a cuss word? You hit your thumb with a hammer. You want to express how you feel. You could use the word beginning with S to express disgust or her name in its place. You'd equate the two. Would you do that with your mother's name? No, sir. Why not? Because, I don't know, that's my mom. You respect her? Yes, sir. But you have done that with God's name. The one that gave you a mother. The one that gave you life. And his name is holy. Damien, that's called blasphemy. So serious in the Old Testament, it's punishable by death. Still think you're a good person? No, sir. One to go, and I appreciate your honesty. Jesus said, whoever looks at a woman and lusts for her has committed adultery already, whether in his heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? No, sir. Except the girl that I'm with now, currently. Well, you have looked with lust then? Yes, sir. This is for you to judge yourself. I'm not judging you because we've just met, but you've told me you're a liar, a blasphemer, and an adulterer at heart. Have you had sex before marriage? Yes, sir. And a fornicator. So, if God judges you by the Ten Commandments, we've looked at four of them, on Judgment Day you're going to be innocent or guilty? I'd be guilty. Heaven or hell? Probably most likely hell. Now, does that concern you? A little bit, but you know, I could always, I could always do better. It's always, you learn from your mistakes. Do you know repentance can't help you in that case? Do you know why? No, I don't. Well, imagine yourself being in a court of law and you've broken the law and it's a very serious crime. Let's say you've, you've robbed a bank and shot a guard and he died. Very serious. And the judge says, you're guilty. And you say, I am guilty, but I want to tell you, judge, I'm very sorry and I'll never do it again. You're going to get nowhere with it. Yeah, he's going to say, of course you should be sorry, and of course you shouldn't do it again. You're going to jail. Yeah. And it's the same with God. We can say we're sorry, and we'll never do it again, which is what repentance is. But of course we should be sorry, and of course we shouldn't do it again. So repentance by itself can't save us. Do you know what can save you from hell? No, sir. You have no idea? Other than praying to God and just make sure you don't break none of the commandments. Too late. They're already broken. 
Yes, sir. You know, it's like saying to the judge, I think I can talk to you some more and I won't break the law again. He's saying, good, you're going to jail. Now, you need something else. Didn't they tell you in the Mormon church? No, sir. You need God's mercy. That's what you do if you're in a court of law and you're guilty and you can't justify yourself. You throw yourself on the mercy of the judge. And the Bible says God is rich in mercy to all that call upon him. Do you know why God can forgive you in an instant? I kind of have an idea, but I'm not really sure. Well, Jesus died on the cross for the sin of the world. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, we broke God's law, the Ten Commandments. Jesus paid the fine. That's why he said, it is finished just before he died. Do you remember he said that? It is finished. He was saying the debt has been paid. If you're in court and someone pays you fine, even though you're guilty, a judge can let you go. He can say, Damien, there's a stack of speeding fines here, but someone's paid him. You're out of here. He can do that, which is legal and right and just. Even though you're guilty, you walk because someone paid your fine. Mm -hmm. And even though you and I are guilty before God of heinous crimes in his eyes, he can forgive us in an instant. Let us walk out of his courtroom because Jesus paid the fine on the cross in full. The Bible says Christ has one suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. So you and I can live forever. Death can be taken off us all because of the death and resurrection of the Savior. And what you must do, and his, this is the essential point, is repent of your sins. Yes, you say, God, I'm sorry. I've used your name as a cuss word. I've lied and I've looked with lust and had sex out of marriage. I've sinned against you, but please forgive me. I'm truly sorry. That's genuine repentance. And then you trust in Jesus like you trust a parachute. Mm -hmm. If you're going to jump out of a plane, why would you put on a parachute? So I could save your life. Yeah, and the motivation would be fear. You don't want to hit the ground at 120 miles an hour. No, sir. So fear in that respect is good because it's driving you to the parachute. And Damien, what I've tried with you, what I've tried to do with you is put the fear of God in you. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says, hoping you'll see that fear as your friend, not your enemy that you're in big trouble, you need a savior, you need to put the parachute on, you need to trust in Jesus and not your goodness. Can you hear what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Is it making sense? It makes a lot of sense. You're gonna think about what we talked about? Of course. I when, think I should. When are you gonna repent and trust alone in Christ? Whenever I get the chance to be alone, whenever I could. Why not now? Who says you're gonna get home? You've got to cross the road, you have a heart attack on the way home. Aneurysm in your sleep, this is your eternity. It's tremendous urgency. You know, 150,000 people die every 24 hours. 150,000. We think death is what always happens to other people, but it's going to happen to us. So please have a sense of urgency and examine my motive. Why would I talk to you like this? It's only because I love you. I care about you. I hate you to end up in hell. I hate you to leave here and say, that was good. That was interesting. I'm going to think about this. And you die in your sins. So do something before the Lord. Get before him and say, God, please forgive me. Will you do that? Yes, sir. Do you have a Bible at home? Yes, sir. Can I give you something we've published called the Bible's Four Gospels? I'd love to give it to you. Is that okay? Yes. Would you be embarrassed if I pray with you? No, of course not. Father, I pray for Damien. Thank you for his open heart today, for his desire to get right with you. Thank you he's acknowledged his sins. And please grant him repentance to acknowledging the truth. And may he today fling himself upon the Savior and trust in your amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 There it is. The Evidence Study Bible will give you everything you've ever wanted to know about subjects such as the theory of evolution, as well as valuable information about the cults and different religions, atheism, and biblical archaeology. It also contains hundreds of quality quotes, fascinating articles, amazing scientific facts in the Bible, and so much more. It even includes answers to 200 of the most commonly asked questions of the Christian faith. The Evidence Study Bible will thoroughly enrich your trust in God and in His precious Word. Get yours at livingwaters.com.